Chat with Traders, episode 115 is supported by squarespace.com. Therefore, if you need a website, whether it be for business or for fun, create it easily, quickly, and with minimal costs by using Squarespace. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com and enter the coupon code TRADERS. That's going to save you 10% off your first purchase and you'll also get a free domain. Make your next move with Squarespace. This is your key to the minds of trading's elite performers, those who profit in relentless markets. Here on the Chat with Traders podcast, you'll hear about the skill sets and tactics that lead winning traders to win so you can level up and become a better trader. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. Ladies and gents, welcome back to Chat with Traders podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Fifield, and on this episode, I invited Adam Grimes on for a second time. He was first on episode 21. You will hear me say episode 20 at the start of the interview, but it is actually episode 21. Um, just wanted to add that small correction in there. Adam's been a trader for more than 20 years. He's traded all major asset classes across various time frames. He's traded independently. He's traded with a prop firm and he's run other trading businesses also. The main focus of this episode was to explore some of the things which discretionary traders can adapt from quantitative traders and vice versa, meaning what things can quantitative traders take from traders who rely on discretion. We thought this would be interesting to discuss as Adam himself is someone who sits in the middle of both. Then in the later part of this episode, Adam lays out a really solid framework for traders who are struggling to make progress, which they can follow and begin moving forward. Also, the types of questions you should ask when you don't know what you don't know. Now, just two things to mention real quick. I'm doing another Chat with Traders meetup uh, taking place in Brisbane on the 19th of March. It's free, of course. For all the details and to RSVP, please go to chatwithtraders.com slash Brisbane. Also, I asked Adam at the end of this episode if he'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have after listening to this episode. So if you would like to ask Adam a question, just go to chatwithtraders.com slash 115, scroll to the bottom of the page and type your question in the comments area. Thanks very much, guys. Hope you dig the episode. Here is Adam Grimes. Well, Adam, it's been almost two years since you were first on the podcast here. How have you been? What's been going on? Anything to report? You know, I, I can't believe it's been that long. Uh, but no, you know, I mean, things have continued to develop. I'm doing, um, have several not work-related projects. You know, I'm doing, I think it's important to kind of do some things outside of the markets because we get so tunnel vision. So I have some interesting personal projects. If you want to chat about those, we can. I'm writing a new book. Um, just began uh, beginning of this year after massive planning, but I'm writing a book on the overlap between discretionary trading and systematic trading. And so, you know, that's, that's obviously going to be relevant to what we're doing here, but, um, no, pretty much business as usual. How have you been? Uh, yeah, I've been doing great. I've been doing great. Um, you know, it's, it's nice to hear that you've got a new book on the way. Um, and that topic is obviously going to be the main focus for this episode, so I'm pretty excited about that. I think it's going to be really interesting and really beneficial for a lot of people listening too. For those who haven't heard our first interview, which I'm pretty sure was episode 20, just paint the picture a little bit. Give us a little bit of background on your trading background. Um, you know, you've been involved in markets for around about 20 years. So just give us a high level overview of that, of that time and some of the things you've done. Yeah, sure. So I've, I've been very fortunate in that I've done a lot. I, you know, I've seen markets from a lot of different perspectives. Um, it's more than 20 years. At some point, I guess I'm going to have to say it's almost 25 years, but been doing this two decades plus. And I started literally with no clue and no legitimate hope for success. You know, I was trading very small accounts. 
massively over leveraged. I didn't even understand the concept of leverage and risk. And I was paying some insane, you know, literally uh, 15, 20 times what you'd pay for a commission today uh, for a round turn. And there's no way I could have been successful. But, uh, you know, along the way and with some mentorship and guidance, I kind of figured out which way was up and, and which way was down, I guess. And I was um, day trading the British pound at the right time and made a little bit of money there and then spent uh, spent a few years, quite a few years actually, day trading the S&P 500 index. And across, I, I wanted to get a better education. So, you know, I'd, I'd been educating myself on these quantitative concepts as, as best I could. But uh, I went and did an MBA and did a good deal of PhD coursework with that to understand how people were looking at markets from a quantitative perspective. Spent a few years on the New York Mercantile Exchange. I've traded for a prop firm in New York. Um, like I said, I've traded for my own account. I put together a commodity pool once I figured things out. Um, and now I am a managing partner and chief investment officer for Waverly Advisors, where I write daily market research covering pretty much everything. You know, I carry the carry the lessons of active trading and my kind of uh, you know, very, I guess, agnostic, maybe, maybe it's the word, but, uh, you know, I'm very reluctant to believe in anything. And I'm able to carry that from a, from an active trading perspective into, uh, also to inform people who trade on much longer time frames. So I've, you know, along the way, I've traded stocks, currencies, futures, options, uh, all time frames from very, very short term scalping to building portfolios for quarters and years. So, so uh, I've kind of been around the block a few times. And I'm not going to ask you too many more questions about that because we covered a lot of this sort of thing on the first episode. So if anyone wants more context around Adam's background, I suggest go back and listen to episode 20. That'll just be chatwithtraders.com slash 20. So the way you're trading these days, Adam, how would you best describe this? So I would best describe it first of all it hasn't changed in 10 plus years significantly um it's a i I think most people would say it's a technical perspective uh and it's technical in that i look at only price i don't look at economics you know economic releases uh, don't look at fundamentals try not to consider um let's say macro and political factors and i'll say try not to but the other piece of this is that my approach is a blend of heavy quantitative and statistical work with discretionary. So as soon as I tell you I'm introducing a discretionary input, somebody who is strictly quantitative might say, well, then you don't really fully understand what inputs you're bringing in, which, you know, I, I can't, I can't disagree with that. But uh, I believe that my process is very technical, very focused on price action. Uh, my trading approach and style is very simple. And that's taken many, many years to to get to that point. Of course, I started with, if I look at some of my old charts, I had multiple indicators. I was drawing all these levels and trend lines and just really marking the charts up because I thought that's how you learn. You know, you put more stuff on and more things that might have an edge. But uh, over time, I've evolved to a style that really is based on just looking to understand momentum and one of the faces of momentum is volatility, or you know, you, perhaps I have that backwards, but understanding how volatility evolves and basically answering the question of, you know, so a market makes a big move, what do we do? Do we position for another big move in that same direction? Do we look for a reversal? Or in fact, is there no edge? Do we do nothing? That's kind of the core of the technical trading question right there. And that's all I try to do with my trading. Okay, very good. Now, this is going to be the the main focus of the episode. You know, we we had a brief chat beforehand and we're going to be talking about how you trade. Obviously, you're quite unique in the sense that you kind of sit in the middle of being a discretionary trader and being a quantitative trader. So, usually traders are either one side or the other, but you kind of sit in the middle. So, you know, let me just ask this question. 
why do you sit in the middle? Like, why are you a hybrid of both sides? Because that's where I have found the best edge. And that's where I believe over many time frames, objectively, there is the best edge. Um, you know, certainly, I think if you're a very high frequency trader, then you're operating at a speed where the human can't really compete. So you certainly can make a case for being purely systematic there. But uh, there is power in human discretion. There, There is legitimacy, I guess might be the word, um, in human intuition, in this kind of implicit process processing and learning that basically you with assuming that you and this is you know a major assumption that you can trade with discipline and emotional control uh, a human acting with some discretion can generally outperform a system okay so you said that for you you've found that that's where the best edge is before we go any further i should probably just get you to clarify or just explain how you think about an edge like what when you talk about an edge what does that mean i know i asked you this uh first time you came on as well but i think it's really important that we just kind of make things clear it is really important and now somebody can go and put these two sound bites sound by side and see if i say the same thing i hope i do <laughs> uh, so you know I, I would say the simplest way to understand an edge is it, we're going to do a lot of trades and so, you know, that that's key that we're, we're talking over a large sample size. And, and by the way, you know, I, I try to put things in what I hope is a simplistic and intuitive framework. So, you know, rather than saying law of large numbers, I'll talk about doing a lot of trades. I'm not trying to talk down to anybody. I just think that this is the best way to understand some of these concepts is to make it as natural as we can. And if you imagine from those many trades, you're going to make two piles of money. You're going to make the pile of money you win and the pile of money you lose because you absolutely, there aren't many things I can tell you with absolute certainty about trading, but one of those things is you're going to have losing trades. You absolutely are going to have losing trades. And if we are trading with an edge, then over the course of many, many trades, that pile of money that we make is bigger than the pile of money that we lose. So that's what an edge looks like in in practice. Now, if we want to drill down a little bit more mathematically, I would say that when we identify an edge in the market, it, and we have we can qualify this. We have to be very careful because there, there are a lot of different ways this can look or different things we could do. But it basically means that there's a higher probability of something happening than something else. If we don't know that, so imagine there is no edge. Imagine that the academics who tell us that the markets just move randomly are correct. If those people are right, then there is nothing we can do that's going to make our results anything other than random. Of course, we're going to pay commissions. So, you know, there's going to be, and there are going to be frictions and financing costs. But if we don't have any edge, then those two piles of money at the end of the day are basically going to be the same, more or less the same. Uh, so what we're hoping to do is to be able to find a spot where there is a tilt in the probabilities in the future of one thing happening over another. Now, what is one thing over another? Naively, I might say the market might go up or, you know, with a higher probability than it would go down. But in reality, it's a little bit fuzzier because the market, or it's, it's a little bit more specific because the market needs to go up over a certain time period. Uh, we might see one edge if we look out, let's just say two to three days, another a month, another six months. We might see that the edge or lack of edge is different at those different horizons. In fact, we probably would. Um, an edge could also be volatility. You know, we it's very easy to get stuck in the mode where I'm looking for a directional edge, but there certainly are non-directional edges. There are points that tell us when this happens, volatility is likely to be higher or lower lower over some time window in the future. But the key is that we're just able to identify something in the market that says over a specific period of time in the future, the probabilities are likely to be shifted from 50-50. So let's drill down into this further. Now we've sort of established exactly what you're referring to when you talk about an edge. What can discretionary traders adapt from quantitative or systematic traders? Well, so this is the thing, you know, when when we had our previous chat and 
Yeah, and we were talking about how unusual it was to do a blend of quantitative and discretionary trading. I think I came around to, well, in reality, that's what everybody is doing anyway. You know, you you have the hardcore system people who think we're exercising no discretion at all. Well, that's not true because you are exercising discretion at every step. You know, you're, what are you researching or are using a genetic algorithm and you're, you know, you, you've specifically decided you're not going to be feeding at things. You're going to let it find things. Uh, how do you determine if the system is quote good enough? How do you determine when to turn the box on, when to turn it off, what size to trade, uh, when something might be changing and you need to take it out of the market? There are these discretionary decisions that go into purely systematic trading. To answer your question more directly, there nobody seriously trades from a – let me figure out how to say this. It, every discretionary trader thinks they are doing something that has an edge. You know, you, you may not be doing statistical research. You, you may not be able to point to thousands of examples in the past, but you believe – when you see this condition set up, you believe that this is more likely to happen in the future. Or, you know, perhaps you believe, you know, maybe you think you figured out something that the market is missing, but you know, that that's still, you think you have figured, you have, think you have identified a tilt in the probabilities. And what happens with a discretionary trader, an experienced discretionary trader is eventually you, you get some sense of what works and what doesn't. And that some sense can be your PL, can tell you very clearly, you know, when, when I did this, I was losing a lot of money. When I stopped doing that, I lost less money. So, you know, you, you've learned something about the market. And the traders who stay in the market long enough from a purely discretionary standpoint, um, is an awkward way to say it, but the purely discretionary traders who stay in the market long enough, they eventually, do their quantitative statistical work through their own trading. That's what it means to evolve a trading style. Now, if you don't want to just go through the school of hard knocks or you don't have the capital to do it or you don't have the decades to do it or, you know, for, for whatever reason, if you're looking for, quote, a smarter way or another way, well, then you can do research and you don't have to learn that that thing that I do, you know, so every day a stock goes up 5%. That's my system. I run in and I buy it the next day and gosh, I lose a lot of money on that. Well, you, you could discover that through research too, right? You know, you, you could do a little bit of quantitative research and see, okay, so I was actually trading against the probabilities there. Um, you also, what other, the, the other thing is a question of mindset. You know, a lot of discretionary traders, you know, I think we all have had the discussions with people in bars who are telling you how smart they are and how they figured this out. And they just bought a boatload of, you know, horrendously out of the money options on something because they figured something, you know, they, they think they've solved the puzzle. And it, it's a lot about, uh, you know, this certain arrogance, you know, and we're all guilty of it, but this certain analytical arrogance. And I think Another powerful message a discretionary trader can take from the quantitative realm is this idea of scientific method, or at least, you know, if not scientific method, then at least scientific approach or framework. Be, and what I, what I mean by that is that we ask questions of the market, we come up with ideas, and then we go to the data. So we, you know, I mean, it, it seems like a pretty simple process, right? You say, does this happen? And then how do you answer it? Well, you can just go to the data and look and find the patterns. And that idea of tying your trading to the underlying, you know, I would say the underlying truths if you want to get philosophical, but the way the market moves, um, that idea is powerful and applies to everybody, no matter how you're trading. Okay, so let's pick up on that last point you made there. So you said... You kind of described it, I think, as a scientific framework. So you said there's questions, you, you go to the data, and you find your answers. How can a discretionary trader do this sort of thing where they ask questions and then they go to the data uh, for those answers? Usually to get those answers, you need some sort of programming capabilities. I presume that most discretionary traders are not really interested in learning how to program. So how can they do this? Like, is there a workaround? Is there some other solution? 
Yeah. So the, the, just before I answer that question, just the idea of understanding that this is what we are going to do. You know, th- th- this is a significant shift, you know, a lot, with a lot of the traders I work with one on one, just the idea of saying, Okay, we're we're going to go to the data and we're going to see what the data says. One of my uh, well, w- w- one of my professors I did a lot of my coursework with had a very gentle way of saying you know we, we would talk through concepts, financial concepts, what we thought would happen in the market, and then he would say, "Let's ask the data." So having that framework, that mindset, that's what we're doing. We're going to ask the data. That alone is a powerful shift of perspective. Now, how do you do that? Well. So I think hidden in your question is a misconception that I had when I started doing this work. I thought, and I think a lot of people share this misconception, this idea that quantitative analysis is so deep, is so complicated and so confusing that it's something that, gosh, I I couldn't possibly do this because I'm not smart enough. I don't have the time. I don't have the desire to, you know, whatever. We can keep listing reasons. Uh, That that's what a lot of people think. But in reality, all you are doing is coming up with a set of conditions and then going back and seeing what happens, what has happened historically. And, you know, granted, I'm I'm simplifying a little bit here, but I would also argue at its core, the discipline is quite simple. That that's what we're doing. Uh, You could do this with nothing more. First of all, there's a lot of free data out there. Uh, So you could do this with nothing more than a free data chart and a pad of paper. Just, you know, let's say your idea is I want to buy. um, uh, What happens if I buy stocks after they go up three days in a row? So you could potentially. Eventually, go back and open a completely free chart and you could just very carefully visually look and see, okay, three days up and then you could record the price and you could record the price, you know, I, I don't know, five days later, so something like that. You, you obviously, you, you need to figure out how exactly you're going to ask the question, but the, the point is to do this analysis at the beginning requires nothing more advanced than access to data and a pencil and paper. Now, what's the problem with that? It's slow and cumbersome and prone to mistakes. You, you certainly, you, you, you may see something that looks like three days up. You may miss it. Uh, you may, you, you, so that there are a lot of things that we can do wrong when we're doing this kind of intuitive, oh, intuitive is not the word. We're doing this kind of manual work, which by the way, I think is important to do this manual work. If you are, even if you are a heavily quantitative character, it still makes sense to spend a little bit of time getting your hands dirty in the data and just seeing manipulating, touching the data on a very elemental level. So what's the next step for the discretionary trader? Well, the next step is Microsoft Excel or some other spreadsheet program where honestly, you know, like I think my mother whose computer skill is pretty much equal to Gmail and Facebook, I could probably teach her in a week to do basic market analysis in Excel. Like anybody can learn to do it. If you, if you have the passion and the desire to learn to do it, you can spend a few hours and what, once you figure out how to Google the questions you have, you can get data in a spreadsheet and you could even then just work manually in that spreadsheet. You could, you know, you create, you know how it works. You create some formulas, but this is, you don't have to, you, you don't have to write a big framework in C++ or Python and pull in hundreds of thousands of data points of tick data, you could do this very nicely with a daily chart and a relatively simple spreadsheet program. So to the people who are, you know, kind of thinking, oh gosh, I could never do this, I would counter, you absolutely can do it. It's it's not nearly as hard as you think it might be. Okay. Now I think a good question for me to ask at this point is, you know, for someone very new to this sort of way of approaching things, what might be some good questions to ask? Like you gave there the, the example of, you know, three days up in a row, what happens after that? What are maybe some other things that, that people could experiment with? Um, because, you know, a lot of discretionary traders are trading like chart patterns, for example. So they might be trading double tops or that sort of thing. That thing's quite difficult to sort of quantify in many ways. Yes. So, yeah. 
what is what are some other good questions that they could ask and and how do they sort of deal with that issue that that's some of the things that they do trade are a little bit difficult to actually quantify like write down on paper well so now we're going a little bit deeper now we're now we're going to the next level and here we touch the real problem with any we're talking about some kind of back testing the the real problem with any kind of back testing is that we are, we don't need to just understand what pattern has been there in the past. That's relatively easy to do. The question is, is it reproducible in the future and is it likely to persist in the future? And that's, you know, I think a lot of people get stuck with market statistics, like, you, you know, the people that do tons of market statistics. Of course, you can calculate anything, but the real question is, is this likely to be meaningful? Is it something that's likely to say something about the market in the future? So why, why that little diversion? Well, for instance, uh, you could have, there, there's no reason why you could not test your complicated chart pattern and, you know, I'll come back around. I, I don't think this is a great idea, but you you could test your complicated chart pattern just by looking at charts historically. And a lot of people do this. You know, you could, let's just say head and shoulders since everybody else in the world loves that. Uh, you know, you could say what happens after a head and shoulders pattern and you could apply this sort of scientific approach. And as you said, you need to define the pattern somehow. You need to say, okay, this is a head and shoulders. This is not. And if you think you just have the skill of picking it out on the chart, okay, you know, okay, I, I, let's live with that for now. And then I'm going to make it a little bit difficult, a little bit more difficult in a moment. But if, if you think you can identify the chart in the past, then you can structure the question. Okay, so what happens one week, one month? Yeah, again, I, I don't know. How, exactly how you want to ask the question, but what happens after the head and shoulders pattern occurs? And then you could answer that again with our piece of paper or spreadsheet. Now, of course, with the pattern recognition, the problem is that what we can identify in the middle of the chart is very different than what we can identify at the right edge. We can easily see patterns in the middle that we can't really see forming in real time. So how how do we challenge the person who thinks he can identify a head and shoulders pattern reliably. The answer is to take some kind of system, and there are many, many systems that will do this, where you can page through one bar at a time or even have, you know, many platforms will play the market back as as the action forms. And then you can do the same thing. So you are, you're exercising discretionary pattern recognition and pattern reading, but you're no longer doing it in the middle of the chart, which is so artificial. You're now doing it one bar at a time. And just, you know, to be clear, the, the, the way I would do this is you'd watch your market and you say, oh, here's my head and shoulders on this bar, you know, the, the, because you, you have to have a point where you're going to execute. So it can't be fuzzy. Maybe, maybe not. You have to have a point where you say, okay, I would do this trade on this bar. And then you track what happens. Uh, I would also be a little bit careful. You probably don't want to, you know, as soon as I say that, you are probably will tend to go into a system trading. Okay, so I would buy here. My stop would be here. My target, if I have one, is here. Uh, once the trade develops, I'm going to move the stop like this, or I'm not going to move the stop. Here's the size I'm going to add if it goes down here. You know, there are all of these other questions. And as soon as I, as soon as I start talking about these questions, if you were mapping out the possibilities, you see this just blossomed into some very complicated, convoluted branch. You know, like like now I'm no longer asking the simple question, what happens after my head and shoulders pattern, which is not such a simple question, but now I've added all of these other things and assumptions. And if we change one of those assumptions, my stop is here instead of here, then we get a different answer. So you create thousands of possible answers. I would not do that. I would focus when you're trying to understand the market movement just very simply on what the market does. So, you know, j just looking at returns, which the word return just means a percent change. Sometimes people are like, oh, you know, when you talk about market returns, what does it mean? It's just a fancy way to say percent change, how much the market moves. But you would be looking at returns over different time horizons just so you understand how the pattern moves. And the person who you need a fairly large sample size, this type of work, um, 
well, let's just say it like it is. You know, it's, it's kind of if you're a numbers nerd like I am, this is a, it's fun to do this for a while, but it does get tedious. It gets difficult. It sucks because you're just looking at a lot of patterns and writing down a lot of numbers. Uh, it, take, it takes a lot of time. But the this is the, you want to trade, right? And we know trading isn't easy, and you don't expect, I hope, to just go buy some four hundred ninety nine dollar system and have all of the answers. It doesn't work like that. It can't work like that. So this is part. This is one way. It's certainly not the only way, but it's one way you could start to understand and learn how the market moves. And so the person who first identifies the head and shoulders patterns in the middle of the market should then do the same thing at the right edge. And ideally, she would do this with a different data set. You know, it's, uh, I, I don't want you really pulling these patterns out of the middle and then just playing the same data back one bar at a time because you've you've learned basically and and you're whether you realize it or not you're you're going to remember and you're going to make some decisions so it should be a clean data set this is not even really possible but that i mean that's quite a deep quantitative question but uh you know because things are so tightly correlated in so many ways but you know ideally what i would like to see if we can deal with these issues is that the data set where you pick them out at the right edge looks something like when you pick them out in the middle and both of those show a similar edge. That would be verification to me that from a subjective standpoint, you can identify the patterns. We're not ready to trade yet. Then we need to work on bridging this gap into actual trading, probably with some forward testing, some very small trading. And then we're, then we're off to the races, but that's one way to do it. Now, as I said, I think that approach has a lot of moving parts. I think, you know, identifying the pattern is not trivial. So perhaps the, and you're right, the, the beginning trader does not know what questions to ask. And I would start by asking questions that, you know, as you do this, don't, don't be afraid of asking stupid questions because as you learn, hope, we hope you're going to be able to look back a few weeks a few months, certainly a few years from now, and you're there's an Einstein quote, right, that he would say, to paraphrase, he says something like, his best hope for the future of humanity is that humanity would look back on people in the middle of the 20th century with uh, pity, with, with a gentle pity. <laughs> and that's, that, you know, meaning, of course, the people have progressed past so many things we struggle with. Hope that That's your hope as a trader that you look back at yourself today from the vantage point of the future and you sort of, oh, you know, I was asking such cute and wrongheaded questions because I've learned more of the right kinds of questions to ask. So at the beginning, it's just a matter of understanding the methodology. You can, you can ask something like, uh, you know, is there any edge to trade to, to buying today if the close is above yesterday's high you can look at very simple relationships of bars we have an entirely other layer of information there are all these indicators and moving averages and things that we can start to add and you know people can do a lot of things around there but i probably would start with price in a more you know at least at the beginning with a more pure view on price because if you just start trading or you start analyzing, say, an RSI or something without really understanding what it might be telling you about price, I think you're probably missing a few steps. So short answer is I would you can ask whatever questions you want. Uh, start with very simple questions and the answers to your questions will probably provoke new questions. Also, uh, let me amend one of my previous answers. You ask what could uh, what could discretionary traders learn from quantitative traders? Well, most quantitative systems fall in a fairly small area, you know, but basically there, there are things that people do pretty consistently and they do it in different ways, whether they're trading mean reversion or momentum, whether, you know, they're trading on different time frames. Uh, so the discretionary trader could, if, if he was interested, could read some of the quantitative books and research and you know he can skip over the code and the more mathy parts if you will uh, i don't think i've ever said that word <laughs> the, the, the more mathy parts and can just look to understand what so you know when, when they're when, when they're doing this mean reverting system 
what element are they queuing into? And, you know, so how, what, what, what does this quantitative approach say about the truth of how price moves? So I think it's also possible that a discretionary trader may get some ideas for the right questions to ask from looking at other people's work and reading some other research. Traders, just a quick break here to thank our sponsors. First up, we've got Squarespace.com. Simply put, Squarespace is for anyone who wants to create their own website. So if that's you and you don't know the first thing about designing a website, no stress because designing a website with Squarespace is an intuitive process. You can take advantage of award-winning templates, tweak them to your own liking, easily add and arrange content. You never need to install or run upgrades. And if you ever do run into a problem, Squarespace has an A-grade support team who are available to you around the clock. So make your next move with Squarespace. Start a free trial today Go to squarespace.com and use the coupon code TRADERS for a 10% saving on your first purchase. Plus, you'll also get a free domain. That's squarespace.com. Also supporting this episode is Proper Cloth because getting a nice dress shirt that fits exactly the way you'd like it to can be a real hassle, but it no longer needs to be that way. Ordering a custom fit shirt with Proper Cloth is a piece of cake. Open your browser, punch in propercloth.com slash traders and follow the foolproof process, which consists of a few simple questions and choosing which high quality fabrics you like. And every shirt you order comes with a perfect fit guarantee. So if for some reason your shirt doesn't fit perfectly, they will remake it for you free. Proper cloth shirts are very affordable starting at just $85, but if you use the coupon code TRADERS during checkout, you'll get $20 off your first shirt. So, forget shirts that don't fit, get on over to propercloth.com slash traders today and use the coupon code TRADERS to save $20. Now, just going back to your answer there, you briefly mentioned it. You mentioned like what sort of answers you're actually looking for. So we've discussed quite heavily what sort of questions might be uh, good questions to ask in, in the initial stages. When you're asking these questions, what are the answers that you're actually hoping to get for? Like when you write down on paper, you said there, you know, the returns. When you talk about returns, there's obviously some time factor involved as well. So what sort of things after you ask these questions, should you have written down on your paper or typed up on your computer or however you're doing this analysis, but what do those answers actually look like? Does that make sense? It does, no, it it does make sense. And I know because of the work that you've done, I know that you're actually hiding a very deep question (laughs) and you know you're hiding a very deep question here. Uh, So the answer depends on on what time frame and what type of question you're asking. If we are, let, let's take the simplest example. Uh, if we're looking at, say, a very short-term intraday system, then really we just kind of hope that the market goes up after our long signals and goes down after our sell signals. And we do need to make sure that we look at enough different market environments. You know, it would be naive if I let's say I create a day trading system and I happen to test it over two weeks of data, which is not nearly enough. And I tested on two weeks in which the market just went up, up, up every day abnormally. And I look at my results and I say, oh gosh, look, look how good the buy signals do here. Uh, sell signals don't work so well. So I found a good buy signal. I'm just going to trade that. I'm done. Well, that's not going to work. You know that. So i uh, what we need to do is to somehow adjust for the baseline, uh, you know, what I would call the baseline, which basically is what happens if we don't do anything to the market. And maybe the easiest way to understand this is to leave the day trading realm and go to, let's say, a longer term technical system for stocks. So let's say you're look, let's say you develop a system, just keep it simple, where you buy stocks and ba- based on some set of criteria. And, you know, this is, a rule set that we can test 
and our exit is we're just getting out one year later. So if we run this system, let's say let's say you run this system and you come to me and you say, Adam, I'm so excited. I found the system and it makes me 5% a year. And I was like, okay, great. So now let me ask you another question. What would happen if you just did buy and hold? And chances are you would go away with that data set and you'd come back and you'd say, well, crap. If I did buy and hold, I probably make seven or eight percent a year, and all of a sudden your system that made five percent a year doesn't look so good. So, and it, the reason th- this is much more obvious at these longer term time horizons, where you know, particularly in stocks over a long period of time, we have an upward drift, and the intuition here is that if I can make seven percent with buy and hold, I just simply have to do two transactions to access that and you know it, it, in the most simple and uh, I have I pay no commissions outside of that it takes also none of my time none of my research it's a very simple thing to do so if I'm going to actively trade then I need to be paid for I deserve to be paid for my efforts to be paid for my time and paid for my risk of being in and out of the market and I'm going to be incurring frictions transaction costs and so I have to with your, you know, if you came back and said, "Oh, you know, so the baseline drift, the buy and hold return is seven percent, and here I found a system that makes on average twelve percent a year." Okay, now maybe we have something to talk about. Um, by the way, interesting aside, it's very, very common in this situation that you might come to me and you might say, "I found a valid sell signal that only loses one percent a year." Meaning that if you were short the stocks, they only went up 1% when everything else went up 7%. Uh, and I'm, I'm using very made up round numbers here, but the, so, and this gets us into statistical significance. So there are two kinds of significance there, at least, right? There, there's statistical significance. And what this means, and, you know, th- there's no way really to answer this question without doing a little bit of math. And the math is, depending on your quantitative background, uh, the math is either trivial or not completely intuitive. But the, you know, the basic idea with significance testing is you want to look at the difference between two things and you want to say, well, how likely is it that I just got lucky or that they're really different? In other words, you know, another way to think about it is how big is the effect? And the effect would be your, so your let's go with our head and shoulders pattern that you know we think when we have the head and shoulders it does this to the market and if i just did buy and hold i would have done this so how big is the difference between those two sets and how variable how much noise uh you know I try to avoid using words like standard deviation but how, how much variability is there in the data so how likely is it that there's an actual difference there there are ways that that's a pretty complicated question, but there are well-established ways that again, you know, anybody with high school math and the desire to learn can absolutely learn that. And many of you had this in school. So as I said, it's trivial. Um, However, there's still the question of economic significance. It is very possible to find things that uh, that short situation where I've seen many, many short signals, which are statistically significant, but they still lose money because you would have been short in a rising market. Your rising market would have just uh, on average a rising market. Your, your, your stocks would have gone up a lot less than the baseline, but they still would have gone up, meaning if you were short you would have lost money. That is statistically significant, but it's obviously not something we're probably interested in trading as an outright. Perhaps we, you know, there could be reasons we might be interested in trading it on relative value. It could have some attractive volatility. You know, there, there could be reasons we would look at it, but as a standalone, that's not an attractive system. It's a losing system. Uh, there are also day traders will, you know, like one of the famous problems of day traders is it's very easy to find systems that do have an edge, but the edge does not cover your transaction costs or it doesn't cover your transaction costs with any leeway. So, you know, you're, and you, you potentially can trade something like that, but it's just a very, very thin tightrope. Um, also, you know, as an aside, be careful if you're doing day trading systems that uh, you, you're accounting for the bid ask spread because a lot of things that look like edges are really just uh, you know bouncing bounces between the bid and ask, and there's something you could not execute at all. So that's if what I just said 
went completely over your head, don't worry about it. But if, if you are doing day trading research, that's certainly something to be very aware of. Now, Adam, I might be jumping around a little bit here, but I think we both know that there are some discretionary traders that the strategies that they trade, if we were to do some like various forms of quantitative analysis on their actual strategies, they wouldn't actually hold up. Yet those traders do still tend to make money. Is that problematic in any way? I mean, the way I interpret that is that the edge really lies within the trader. Well, I mean, it depends what you're trying to do. It's and I would argue the edge does lie within the trader. I think that's legitimate. I think you are correct. Um, and I think there certainly are traders who trade very, very well like that. I think anybody, anybody trading, you know, with, with a discretionary input, you are part of the edge. So what are the drawbacks? Well, one of the drawbacks is, and you know, this is something that's happened traditionally. There have been many, many successful traders who cannot teach. And many, many successful traders who they don't understand why they make money. You know, let, let, let me give you a completely absurd example. But, you know, there were traders back in the back in the days of the pit. There were traders who had lucky ties and they wore these ties for years and years, even after they shredded and started falling apart. So they're just wearing some little stub of a tie and it becomes this superstitious thing. Now, the guy probably knows if you if you if you really sat down and had a heart to heart, he probably knows that his, uh, you know, his, his trading prowess is not tied to the magic tie. But th- there you, you, you can just take that a few steps and you can see there are people who are using things that don't have an edge that. Yet they can make money, but they don't understand why they make money. So they think it's because of the magic moving average or the magic indicator or the magic news, you know, what, whatever, what was squawk box, whatever they're listening to. And they have some skill that they don't understand. This is impossible. And by the way, we, you see the same thing. Trading is not unique. Uh, you, you see the same thing in, yeah, in music. Uh, I was a professional musician before I was a trader. We didn't talk about that background, but you certainly see many musicians who can't teach simply because they don't understand how they do or why they do it, how, why they're able to do what they do. Uh, so the, they, they might teach in all sincerity. They might really care. They might be the most engaged teacher in the world, but if they don't have the tools to truly understand how they do what they do, they can't teach it, they can't transmit it. And that certainly has been an issue with trading. Uh, one of the other issues, one of the, you know, you just asked me a broad question, is it problematic? It's problematic because if you are the part, if you are part of your edge, then anything that happens to you can affect the edge. You know, some of the traditional things, if a trader runs into financial trouble, let's say a real estate problem or a tax problem or an illness in the family or they're going through a divorce, traders will typically lose money through those times. And the reason perhaps is because their emotional element, you know, their emotional makeup is so compromised that they're not able to apply this powerful discretionary analysis that they've learned to do over the years. And so they lose their ability to read the market. If you, if, if you are part of your edge, then perhaps your edge is a little bit more vulnerable. Now, you know, so this is one of the arguments for trading in a more systematic approach, but I, you know, I think it's important to be aware that this is this is a potential problem, but it is it does not necessarily invalidate the discretionary approach. It's just something to be aware of. Let's switch tables now. Um, you know, the question I asked you earlier: What can discretionary traders uh, adapt from quantitative traders? You know, I think we spent a bit of time on this. Let's turn things around. So, what, in your opinion, can quantitative traders or, or systematic traders call them what you will? Um, adapt from discretionary traders? Well, it depends on what kind of quantitative trader you are. There certainly are quantitative traders who who trade the types of systems that should remain purely, purely, I mean, you know, whatever word you want to apply, algorithmic, I guess, purely rules-based, and they exercise no discretion in the execution. Um, those traders certainly exist. I would, however, say that 
some of those traders probably should be a little bit more open to the I hesitate to use the word creative, but uh, let's go ahead and use the word creative to, to the creative aspect of doing research. Because as a quantitative trader, you're going to need to generate and refine ideas. And as you monitor your system performance, you're going to find the edges come and go and things will need to be tweaked. You know, I shouldn't say absolutely, but almost certainly you're going to find this. And so I think being open to... Some of the quantitative people I have known have been quantitative to, let's say, almost to a fault. They're very rigid. They think there's only a, you know, very numerical way to see things. And I think some of these people could probably open themselves to insight. Maybe that's the phrase. Uh, and what does that look like? Well, you know, I mean, as a, former composer of music, I can talk a lot about creativity and how you take ideas and turn ideas and look at ideas in different ways. But, you know, I think at at least that person should try to find some new ways to look at the data. And it, it could literally be as simple as if you normally sit at your desk, then, uh, you know, take a printout out and go, and, and go for a walk and be careful crossing the street, you know, but just, just somehow shift your work environment enough that you look at things differently, uh, have some specific brainstorming sessions, be very, very, very sensitive to the message of subconscious intuition. If you find yourself dreaming about something or thinking about something or obsessing about some small element, uh, you know, go into it deeper. Uh, you know, perhaps consider I'm a big believer in doing different kinds of meditation and breath work and things like that. Uh, you know, there certainly is uh, there, there certainly is plenty of room for that. Different ways to open yourself to different kinds of intuition and insight. And I think if, if nothing else. The very strict and, you know, not to pick on engineers, but a lot of these people come from engineering backgrounds. Uh, a lot of these people, in my experience, could benefit from a just, you know, a, a different perspective. And I mean that in, in the most literal sense, just looking at the data a different way from a different angle, just a different perspective. Right. And I'm not sure how to best ask this question, but I feel as though... I feel as though discretionary trading probably plays a lot more on human behavior in markets, uh, more so than quantitative trading. Maybe that's not a fair comment to make, but I think you kind of know where I'm going with this. Like, how do you factor in human behavior into like quantitative analysis? Well, you have, you personally have done some system development, I know. And I would argue the patterns you look at, the patterns the market generates are always, you've done it already, whether you realize it or not. The patterns you have analyzed are shaped by human behavior because this is, that this is what moves prices. The, you know, the reality is we might wish we lived in a sterile academic white lab coat environment where you know, consider the efficient market perspective, the market generates data or, you know, people, data is generated. It comes into the market. It's immediately and correctly processed and people immediately make the correct decisions and execute those decisions with no time lag. The world doesn't work like that. And we know that. So what, what is far, what is far more likely to happen is that every decision made in the market include, because we're human includes both an element of analysis and an element of emotion. And there are times when these play, you know, there are times when I would say markets are very rational. There are times when I would say markets are very emotional. And if you have identified a pattern, because it's, you know, for, as a quantitative trader, that's what you do. You identify a pattern and then, you know, you're, you're very familiar with the process I, with the process I outlined earlier, where you look to understand what happens after that pattern. That pattern and what happens after that pattern is shaped by human emotion. And then, you know, so you might ask the, the question, the next step removed, well, you know, what if everybody starts to trade more algorithmically? What if the market becomes more and more algorithmic? Well, those algorithms still encode human behavior in the rule set of the algorithm. So there's still human emotion and behavior and there's still, you know, in the limit, there's still people 
turning off boxes when things get really crazy or there, you know, there's still when markets go outside parameters, the way things trade change. So there are, um, you know, th- th- there are all of these elements baked in. And I would argue that it's always there that any kind of trading is already accessing human behavior, focusing on human behavior. Earlier, you made the comment that there's an argument that if you apply discretion to your quantitative research, that it kind of throws off the accuracy of that research. So, you know, just in regard to your own trading, how do you deal with that? Well, so one of the keys, I think, is you need to define very clearly what is discretionary and what is not. In other words, you know, what what is an appropriate realm for discretion and what is not so position sizing for me is not discretionary i i can't say oh i have a high competence in this trade because well first of all that would be illogical because i know at best i have a very small tilt so there's no point where i can say i must be right about this i mean i I don't really know Uh, so i'm not i i can't go in quadruple size on a trade because i think the chart Patterns really pretty. I'm, I can't do that. Uh, but there are so, so you know for me the discretionary element is within some you, you set quantitative parameters for you know say stop placement stop could be here could be here I'll put it here based on subjective factors and there's still the question you know if uh, my trading is pattern recognition based so there's still the question of you know is this a valid pattern should I enter here and there certainly are points where uh, you know, somebody can come back to me and say, I've had many, many people do this. Was this not the same pattern? Were you not looking at it? And, you know, for, for whatever reason is, is a discretionary input, I decided not to take the trade at that time. Um, so, you know, there's the question of, you know, enter or not enter. And it can be because of, you know, correlation with other markets or other types of risk. But, uh, it's, it really is a matter being a discretionary trader does not mean you can just do what, whatever the hell you want. You know, I, I, th- I think, I, I think some people from, you know, particularly from a quantitative background who are suspicious of discretionary trading, that's what they think that we mean. You know, you, oh, you, you just do whatever you want. And I think people who approach discretionary trading like that probably don't trade very long because the reality is you can't do whatever you you want the market will encourage you to do the wrong things at the wrong time you you make up you make a pile of bad decisions and end up doing exactly the wrong thing at exactly the wrong time enough times and you're out of business so it it really is a matter and you know Look, I think we we just had an almost hour podcast where nobody said discipline. How often does that happen, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think th- I think this is the discipline word. You know, that this is this is part of the discipline of discretionary trading is being very clear on where and how you will use discretion. It's not a free for all. I really like that answer. I really do like that answer. I think um, I think that was Will said. Um, this question might help. I think to kind of bring this whole topic together. You mentioned to me uh, when we had a call uh, before this that you're about to start trading some markets and, and doing some things that you've not previously traded before. I think uh, one of those one of the things you mentioned was commodity spreads. So I'm just interested to know how are you actually approaching this? Like when you decide to trade a new market and explore something new, What's the starting point for you and how do you kind of approach that that whole process from like deciding this is something you're going to explore to actually getting to the point where you're actively trading it? Well, I mean, so you uh, – there are basic reasons, you know, I would almost say financial reasons why – you why some markets might be more attractive than others. For instance, um, you know, beginning traders jumping into futures, it's a little bit difficult to deal with the leverage. You basically have to take a lot of risk on a single trade. Well, I mean, let, let's say let's say swing trading futures. So you're you're holding for a few weeks. Uh, that's a, that might be a difficult way for a new trader to start because you're going to be literally risking thousands of dollars on a trade. Um, so, you know, there are economic realities that could tell us 
that some markets are more attractive than others. Of course, depending where you are in the world, you have easier or harder access to different markets. So some of these decisions are kind of made for us. Uh, there are also questions of of trading style. And this is something that's a little bit hard to, you know, it's not a little bit hard, it's extremely hard to know at first. Um, you know, like everybody in the world wants to day trade and they want to day trade currencies because of the leverage or stock index futures. So everybody kind of wants to right away do the most difficult thing where there might not even be that much of an edge and they think they're going to quadruple their money in a month because of what some website said they could do. And so, you know, at, at the beginning, we all kind of start there, you know, in some variation of that most of us do with you know, I certainly did with, with no clue whatsoever. But, you know, th- there are things like more quantitative types tend to be drawn to options or bonds. Um, the question of if you have actual legitimate expertise in an area, like, you know, I know people who trade medical and pharmaceutical stocks with medical backgrounds. That makes sense. Um you know, there's also a false sense of this too. Sometimes, like I thought when I started trading, you know, I I grew up in a farm community. I have a pretty good idea of how things go into the ground, come out of the ground, what 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 eats what, and what's used for what, and you know how you process these things. And I did a little bit more research, and then I thought I was really educated. And so, you know, I thought I I thought I had some special knowledge and skill in agricultural futures that turned out to not be true. And you know, I think there are a lot of people who, for instance, may think they have some fantastic skill in trading stocks that are really active in the news. And you know, it's like uh, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But you can answer that question with your you know with an objective look at your trading results. Uh, so people are drawn to markets for different reasons, some good, some bad. Uh, you do need to consider the practicalities of whether you should be trading a market. And then I think you, you know, to, to some extent, I'm going to say something that is probably a meaningless statement, but uh, in every market, there are a lot of things that are the same and there are a lot of, there, there are, are fewer things that are very, very different. And, you know, we need to understand what is the same, you know, like if you, um, you know, if things go up, things go down, things trade, you know, you need to understand the kind of basic like entry level, you know, when's my market open? When's it closed? How do I execute? What kind of account do I set up? Uh, so you, you certainly should have that kind of knowledge before you execute. But, you know, then you need to know things like the, uh, you know, a stock trader sometimes is very surprised when he goes to trade options and he pulls up an option that is priced at 350 on his screen and he sees that it's bid at 365 offered at 430 <laughs> and, and you know it's like oh, I've never seen that in a stock and oh by the way this thing hasn't traded in the past 10 minutes and so it's understanding you know what what might be different both from the mechanical standpoint like that but also how does the thing move differently um, and you know there are objective differences in different assets for instance on a daily time frame stocks mean revert more than commodities. This is why you don't really hear people talk about trend following in stocks unless they're really stretching the concept. And by the way, generally not taking shorts. Uh, you know, it's but but people certainly do trend following commodities, and you can execute some type of trend following in currencies. Where if you you know you see a lot of people who trade mean reversion in individual stocks, but you don't really do the same thing in currencies because. It's the, the market, there's some difference in the way the market moves. And you figure this out when you, you know, there are a lot of ways you can figure it out, but, uh, you know, hopefully you figure it out by doing some research to understand how the market moves. And then you craft your trading approach and you go through this process of creating a trading system, back testing it, forward testing it. And then you start trading with a small size. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it's literally not rocket science. It's, uh, if a fairly basic and repeatable template, but I do think another caution here is that many people develop skill in one market. And my experience has been every time I've gone into a new market, there's been an adjustment period. And, you know, I hope you can hear 
when I say adjustment period, that that's actually code for losing. So, so there, there, there's a period where you go into a new market and you, you are, you are not going to take your skills from another market or another time frame necessarily and just start making money right away. You're going to go through a significant adjustment period. So you, you got to figure out how to structure your life and business so you can live through that without too much damage. Just before we get off this topic, you know, what we've been talking about for most of the episode this far, you know, we've been talking about some of the things that quantitative and systematic traders can take from discretionary traders and vice versa. Um, You know, the the goal is not to try and uh, push a trader in one one way or the other. It's just to talk about, you know, some of the things which um, can be helpful across the board. So, is there anything which you would like to add to the, the things we've discussed already? Is there any anything that you might like to add? Is if I missed a question that you think is important uh, regarding this topic? No, I yeah, you know, I think you've done a. I think you've asked the right questions here, and you know, like if we were sitting in a bar, we could have a twelve-hour conversation about these topics. But uh, I've. I think we hit the essential points and, you know, m- maybe kind of to recap that it's, it's hard to know what to say, right? Because you don't know who the audience is. Uh, everybody listening is listening from a different perspective, but if you're listening to this thinking, I could never do this research stuff. Uh, you know, I, I want to say to you very, very clearly you can, it's, it's not nearly as hard as you think. Um, I, I mean, my formal education, I was a musician. I had, I had, I think, one math course in college, and it was basically where we talked about how math concepts made us feel. I, I, I had, I had no math, I had no training, and I, I, but, but because I had an interest in learning to do this, I actually developed some respectable quantitative skills, uh, just because I had to have them. I, you know, I, I knew that I needed this to understand the data, and you can do it too. Uh, we hear a lot about how trading is hard. Uh, there are a lot of ways to make trading harder, but um, I, I think that one of the ways to make it easier is to clearly lay out a plan of attack and what you need to know and what skills you need to develop. Because, you know, I mean, the uh, maybe a topic for a future podcast is this isn't really about knowledge. You know, it's, it, we, we have knowledge. We have things that we know about markets or things we think we know. But then the skill of trading and the skill of applying these is not, you know, it, it's, it's extremely important. It's not just what you know. Uh, but if you don't have the knowledge, then it's hard to develop the skills because you don't know what you need to be doing in the first place. So, you know, th- that's to the discretion trader who thinks he can't do this and to the quantitative trader who thinks that uh, any discretionary stuff is just BS to use a kind word for it uh, you know I, I I would say I think you're probably wrong I, I think you are cutting yourself off from a potentially powerful way of knowing yes there are many cognitive biases there are many mistakes there are many emotional mistakes if you think you have run to systematic trading because you did not have the emotional control to trade as a discretionary trader god be with you good luck that's probably not going to work uh, and, and you know this is something we hear from a lot of people but the uh, you you are going to have to have you are going to have to have emotional control. You are going to have discipline and uh, having a systematic approach is not a substitute for that. It may make some things worse. It may make something, it may make a lot of things better, but you are still going to face many of the emotional issues of trading, perhaps magnified because guess what? Now you're one or two, you know, the thing about the discretionary trader, I have control. I can go get out of my positions tomorrow. You have, you know, it's one of the dark secrets of quantitative trading is you, you're a little bit out of control. Your control is two or three steps away. And sure, you could intervene and close everything, but you don't have, you, know, you some people actually experience a magnifying of emotions with quantitative trading, which seems counterintuitive, but it, it's actually quite common. So just, you know, if, if you are coming from a very rigid quantitative perspective, uh, I would argue that an intuitive discretionary perspective is not completely other, is not completely different than your way of analyzing. It's just another perspective. It's another way to focus the, you know, pr- pretty profound cognitive power that's between your ears on the market problem. 
Now, Adam, you're a member of the Chat With Traders Facebook group and I posted in the group yesterday, I, I mentioned that I was going to be having you on the podcast again and if anyone had any questions, I would try and squeeze them in if we had time. So, um, I know we've run for over an hour already, but I think um, I think we've both got a bit of time. So, I'm going to ask a couple questions that came from out of the group and just for anyone listening, if you do want to join uh, the group, of course, it's totally free. Uh, just go to chatwithtraders.com slash Facebook. That'll redirect you to the actual group page. You just hit the join button and I'll accept you. So, uh, pretty straightforward. Um one of the first questions that came through, and I thought this was quite a good question um, and very relevant to uh, you considering how you trade, what are your thoughts on trading many asset classes versus just trading, let's say, equities only, um, just as an example? Because often traders and you know some of the traders who have had on the podcast here really advise against this and they sort of tell you just to focus or or not tell you, they, they talk about how they do. What they do is they just focus on one asset class and, and that's particularly advice given to beginner traders as well, less experienced traders. What are your thoughts on trading many asset classes versus just focusing on one? I'm curious, are those traders who give that advice, are they generally day traders or would you say it covers a range of timeframes? Uh, well, the one trader that comes to mind, um, probably because it was just uh, recently, uh, would probably be George uh, Rowley Trader. He was on episode, I think it was 110. Um, so, he's an equities trader. He trades in the um, Australian markets. But yeah, he's he's not a day trader as such. He's more of like a swing, a swing trader, I guess you could call him. Um, and I don't mean to single him out. I'm just... <laughs> bringing that no, up no, it's, because, I, yeah, yeah I, I just kind of threw the question out. So I think from a, you know, from a day trading perspective, you could easily make the case. Uh, the, the answer to this question is it depends. <laughs> so I'll put the answer up front. Uh, from a day trading perspective, yeah, you, you know, you, you want to dig deeply into market. You want to get familiar with its quirks, with its time of day influences, with what happens with other markets and, uh, you know, how influences might flow back and forth. And to do that, you know, to begin to develop, let's say you're an active day trader, uh, you probably would need to spend, I don't know, six months at least before you start to develop some real knowledge of a particular market. Uh, it is very, very difficult, depending on the type of day trader you are, to follow more than one market. So there certainly is a justification for specialization there. There also is a justification for specialization based on the information you use. For instance, if I were an equities trader who traded off of, you know, let's just say uh, earnings releases or off of changes to language in earnings releases or SEC reports or something like that, uh, obviously I have, and, and, the, and then let's say I'm that kind of trader and you drop me in commodities, I, I got nothing. You know, because because I, I I have no information, or you know, if I'm a commodity trader who trades on crop reports, and then you put me in the currency market, I don't I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know what to do. Uh, so th there are po there are possibilities for having legitimate edges based on certain types of information that are asset class specific. Now, if neither of those things is true, if you don't need to focus on one, um, then you or you're not using specialized information. So let's say you're more of what we would call a typical technical trader. I think you still need to be aware. So, you know, here is one of the lies, I think, of traditional technical analysis is we are told you can apply the same systems the same tools, the same chart patterns, the same indicators to any market or any time frame. Have you ever heard that? Of course. <laughs> right. Yes. And, you know, so I can tell you, I can show you then, well, I can create a very simple quantitative test. Let's just say uh, buying a breakout of 20 day highs. And if we apply that in commodities, you would see buying 20 days high, 20 day highs, shorting 20 day lows would make you a little bit of money, all other things being equal. Uh, and then if we apply the same system in stocks, it would lose us money. So then I would say, well, I think what we've seen here from a very simple test is 
an expression of this idea that commodities tend to trend a little bit better. So if this is true, why would we expect that we could just apply something blindly without even knowing what's on the chart. Now, I think there's some truth. I, I, I don't think, you know, the idea that you can cover up the, what it, what's on the chart and cover up the, the, the price scale. So I don't know if we're looking at soybeans or wheat or, or whatever. I, I think you probably could make a lot of good tr- trading decisions based on that. But I do find at least personally, because I'm aware of the quantity Quantitative difference with the power of mean reversion, you know, the balance of, let's say, the balance of mean reversion and momentum, because that's how, that's how I think of it. You know, from a quantitative perspective, you have these two forces, mean reversion and momentum, which typically tend to be in balance when they're, I, I'm telling you something that I believe, you know, this is not something that I know is know to be true, but I think when they're in balance, that price probably moves pretty randomly. I think this is why a lot of research projects that look at price movement, say price random walks, when those forces are in balance, they do. When we're able to identify points where one force is likely to, and, you know, this goes back to an edge, one force is likely to prevail in the future, then we will find that price movement is not so random. And because I'm aware that this balance of mean reversion momentum is different in different markets, I will do types of trades. I think it's subtle, but I think it's real. Uh, I'll do types of trades in currencies or commodities that I would not do in stocks and vice versa. Also in stocks, I am very aware that I may think I'm the smartest stock trader in the world. And by the way, I'm very aware that I'm not. But you know, I might think that I do the best stock selection possible but I know I can be long the six best stocks in the market. And if something happens that cracks the market tomorrow, I'm going to lose on anywhere from four to six of those. And, you know, in fact, the, it's just so tightly correlated. And that's not really a concern that we have with most other things. But, you know, we certainly need to be aware of concentrated currency exposure or, you know, if you have on a long trade and crude, uh, in crude RBOB and heat, you don't really have on three positions there, but you know, then you have on one in nat- natty at natural gas, then, you know, m- maybe you do have another position there. You know, you need to understand the correlations and how things move together. So I think you, I think you need a level of understanding that goes beyond the simple chart pattern. Now, I don't mean to, you know, I want to be very careful about this. Because I think sometimes people talk about trading concepts like they're so complicated, you could never learn this. And, uh, you know, like one of the things with the traders that I work with, you know, we work on very simple concepts and, and all of this stuff is like, like, you know, this insight that I've just talked about. I think somebody trading an asset class for a year or two will get a very good sense of this. And I think if you, if you trade it and do the research, you can have a pretty good understanding. So, you know, for me, there, there's a certain diversification and I can point to many, many times when my stock trading has sucked, but I've made enough money in currency to make up for it. Uh, you know, another way to think about that is I had great trades in currencies and lost it all in stocks. But, you know, at, at, at the end of the day, uh, you, even though you would think trading commodities, they're relatively uncorrelated as an asset class, you do see some kinds of wins and losses that, that come into phase with each other. And generally, not always, but generally speaking, if you're going between these asset classes, you may be able to smooth out your equity curve. So, you know, the answer is it, it depends that that's my answer. But I think, uh, is there room for somebody to specialize just trading one particular stock ticker? Absolutely. Is there room for somebody to just trade a single currency or just swing trade, uh, wheat or something? You know, absolutely. There are people who do that and do that well. So, uh, truly it depends. Okay. I think it is probably a fair suggestion for you know, less experienced and and traders who are very new to this to just kind of narrow their universe though. Would you agree in that? I think so. Narrow and simplify. Um, Yes. And, you know, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, You know, I I think it would be irresponsible to think you're going to trade everything all at once. Um, But I I think pick some place to focus focus on it a few years when you have a little bit of proficiency, which, you know, honestly, depending where you are in the learning curve, that may not mean you're profitable. Let's be clear, the learning curve is usually several years. Uh, in fact, I've never seen it be significantly less. Um, 
you know, so once you've developed some skill and then you want to investigate another asset class, I think that's fine. But what a lot of people do is they'll kind of be like the, um, you know, like, like the bee that's bouncing from flower to flower to flower, just, you know, and if you do that with trading systems and approaches, you never give yourself time. Not only you never give yourself time to really learn, but you also never give yourself time for all of these things. What was the first thing I said, I think, was that all of this stuff only works if we do a lot of trades, if we collect a lot of data. And if you develop a trading system and, you know, you go and you do five trades and you're not happy with the five trades and you trash it and move on to another trading system, that's probably not a, not the way you're going to build a career. So you definitely need to spend enough time in one place that the law of large numbers starts to work for you or against you, let's be honest. Uh, but you, you start to see some clarity and you start to develop some skill. Absolutely. Absolutely. This question also came in. Uh, this, the question is, what advice do you have for struggling traders who have lost several accounts? I mean, it's a very basic question. I think it's probably a good question to ask. Um, I usually try to steer away from using the word advice, but what are your maybe um, some tips that you could uh, give for for someone who's just generally struggling, like they've just been trying to make something work and they're trading for a few years or a couple of years and just kind of feel as though they're not really making any progress. They've lost several accounts. What, what do you think they maybe need to do? Well, okay, so let me... Let, let me outline the structure that I use when I coach and mentor traders, because I, I think, you know, for, first of all, working with a coach or a mentor is one possibility, but many people can do this work for themselves. You don't necessarily have to work with somebody. So this is not, this is not an ad. This is a structure that I think anybody can use. So the first thing I do with a struggling trader is I stop the bleeding. And, you know, I can't tell you over the years how many I, I can't, how many people have come to me and said, I'm losing money. That's the first thing they'll tell me. I'm losing money. I'm struggling. I've blown out several accounts. I, I'm learning this trading system. And can you help me increase my size? Now, you, you, as I tell you that, you probably can't even believe that I've been asked that, but I've been asked that many times, many, many times. People don't understand, you know, it's like for some reason, increasing size will solve my problems, uh, you know, or they trade for prop firms that want them to increase size, even though they're losing. And of course, we understand everything that might be going on there. Uh, so the first thing you do is you stop the bleeding. And what this means is you stop trading. If you, if you, you cannot learn to trade without trading. This is true. And I know many of you are already, you know, kind of, kind of pulling on the leash and saying, you know, but I, I got to be in there. I, I got to be in it to win it. I got, I got to, I got to have some skin in the game. You've, you've done that. You've lost. You, you, you've, you've been bloodied by the market. So you've, you've had that experience. We're going to come back to that. But the first thing we do is you stop trading and you stop the bleeding. The second thing you do is, and by the way, that's very important. That's the first thing you do. The second thing you do is let's look at your trading plan. Oh, you're what? <laughs> you know, so now a lot of these struggling traders have this kind of, oh, shit, look on their face. My, my what? Uh, yes, you know, you're, you're very well written out, precise trading plan that tells me what you will and will not do in the market and how you will do it and how you will evaluate your results and how you will change your plan and how, you know, how you will grow as a trader and what your plan is over, you know, but, but both on the individual trade level, what markets will you trade? What, what gets you in and out of a market? And also, you know, how are you going to grow this business? How are you going to know if it's working? All those questions. Let's see that document. And here you can hear the thunderous silence. So most people who are struggling do not have a plan. That's, you know, that, that, that's my point. I'm hope that I hope I'm making somewhat humorously here. So you write a trading plan. And there again, there's no one right way to do that. But, uh, you know, I have some ways that I structure trading plans. And from there, you now you have a trading plan that says what you are and are not going to do in the market. That's step two. We stop the bleeding. You created a plan. Step three is you back test. And stop rolling your eyes. You know, I can already hear everybody rolling their eyes. Back tests are worthless. Yes, I think back tests are almost worthless, but here's a way we're going to make it useful. And, you know, depending on how your, how your plan is structured, perhaps it's a plan that we can test algorithmically. Perhaps we can program it. Uh, and we have some tools to do that. Or, you know, 
uh, equally powerful is we go bar by bar. And if we go by bar by bar, we're going to talk about, you know, looking at different assets. You know, let's, let's not look at just energy stocks from 2008 to 2010. Uh, you know, we're going to look at different assets. We're going to look at different time frames. Uh, I shouldn't say time frames. We're going to look at different market regimes. Let's say that. So we're going to look at periods when the market was flat, when the market was up, when the market was down, volatility increasing, decreasing. We just need to make sure that all of this is captured in the back test. And you're going to come back to me after a period of a couple weeks of, you know, a couple weeks to perhaps many weeks of very rigorous work. And you're going to say, I have this back test. And we're going to look at the numbers of the back test. And one thing that I can tell you with, uh, you know, and, you know, with, with a high degree of certainty is if your back test doesn't look good, it's not going to look better if you start trading it. Now, also, you, you may have a back test that shows me that you're going to start trading the system and buy every building in Manhattan in two years. And, you know, I would caution you, let, 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 let's wait and see because, you know, the, the point is your results are not going to look as good as the back test, but we have the back test. So now we have some idea we think of the potential in the system. What have we done? We've stopped the bleeding. We've created a system, uh, a trading, a trading rule set, and we have back tested it. The next step, and there are only really two more steps. The next step is back tests can be crap for a lot of reasons. And one of the reasons is that we've created something in a back test that we cannot replicate. A classic example would be, let's say that you have a back test where you're buying at the moving average. Uh, what people don't realize is that the moving average, what people might not realize at first, is the moving average moves as the bar is forming. So we're going to have a number of situations where, uh, let's say, the bar opens and the moving average is below the bar. And then let's say it never goes down from the open. It just goes straight up, but it goes up enough that by the close, the moving average is pulled above the open into the range of the bar. Can you visualize that? Most, you know, if you haven't thought about it, it might be a little bit of a difficult concept, but I guarantee you stuff like that happens. And if you tell me you buy at that moving average, um, there's no way you could have executed that in real time. That's one example, but this type of, let's call it time machine trading, where we're bleeding information from the future somehow, happens in a lot of different ways in the back test. And our solution for this is we forward test it. So still using no money, you take a period of time. And depending on the system, this sometimes can take a long time. So, you know, th th this is a commitment, but you want to learn to trade, right? That, you know, I I'm not going to give you something you can do in two or three days. There's, there's nothing I can do to change you to, to change your results in two or three days. You're going to have to go through this process of doing this work. And so the next part of this is you are basically think of it like this. You're back testing, but you're doing it in real time. So, or, you know, really it's a forward test. So you're doing theoretical executions. And yes, there's no emotion involved and your actual executions at each stage will probably Probably see a little bit of degrading of the edge. So in other words, your forward test is probably not going to look as good as the back test. The next stage is we start trading it with real money. First of all, on vanishingly small size. If you, if you come to me with a million dollar trading account and we get to this stage, if you're a stock trader, you're literally trading no more than 100 shares perhaps ideally i would prefer you to trade one or two shares but there can be some execution issues there uh so you're still trading vanishingly small size absolutely no emotional involvement from the pnl you know if you uh if you buy the stock and it goes to zero you're you you lose fifty dollars where you know your actual probable risk on the trade is more like a few cents so you're not making any money you're not losing any money yes you're paying commissions that's tuition we're not concerned about commissions you so we're looking at the results you know backing commissions out but what i want to see here and you know i think you're starting to see the thread we've we've stopped the bleeding we've created a trading plan or refined the one you have We've seen what kind of edge it has in a back test. We've seen in the forward test that that edge can be identified in real time. That's what you've proven there. And now we're actually trading with very, very small size. And now what you're proving to me is that we can actually execute those points. 
and we go through the process of collecting data. And then the key idea with all of this, which you know probably I should have put up front, but the, the way I think about this is you must earn the right to trade bigger. You have to earn that right. It's, yes, it's your money, it's your risk, but how do you earn that right? Well, you earn that right, now we shift into uh, a very behavioral mode. And we're basically evaluating each trade with how well did you follow the rules? How well did you follow the system? That's all that matters. If the system is somehow jacked up, then you know we've got to go back and change the system, and that happens. You know, this is I'm drawing a straight line here. A lot of times, it's much more of a meandering path where we go back and you know change, then do another back. You know, so th- there th- we can have many branches here. But once you've once you have something that looks good, good back test, good forward test, good very very small size, then you prove to me, or rather, you prove to yourself that you can execute with perfect discipline. And then you earn the right to trade a little bit bigger. And once now you're trading a little bit more meaningful size, but still probably under your target size, you do this for a while with perfect discipline. And by the way, if if you don't think you have the patience or the discipline to get through this process, then maybe you don't have the discipline to be a trader because a lot of trading kind of sucks. <laughs> that's, that's what they don't tell you. You know, a lot of it is a real grind. And, you know, so at each stage here, you're showing you can execute with discipline. This is where psychology, you know, I haven't actually here, we just had an hour and a half interview and I haven't said the P word. I don't think I've said psychology up to this point, but psychology plays a part through all of this. But, you know, now the at each phase in the process the reason i built this out in these silos is then somebody else will probably rip the structure off i guess whatever uh you know the 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 reason i built this out into these silos is because different aspects are important at different section at at different areas and here we're looking at execution skills and here's where we also really start to focus on the psychology of execution versus the psychology of research and psychology uh, of developing an edge which is a separate thing uh you know psychology is not quite as simple as just following the rules but uh at the end of the day that's that's the process so you know you, you can work through that with somebody you can work through that with a group of somebody's um i'm also a big believer in working in a team uh trading is it but you need to be careful about that this does not mean working in a trading room where you're sharing your calls and ideas with 20 other people uh, you know i mean working with somebody where you know i hesitate to use the word but you work with very intimately uh, even to the to the standpoint ideally of where you would share pnl and you know i'll tell you what this does is so many traders find themselves just doing stupid shit yeah, just, just to say it like it is, uh, you know, how many people take boredom trades or they, you know, get out of trades early or they take trades, you know, whatever. You, you've, you've heard the list of things. You've probably done them. Uh, we all have. Uh, but you're much less likely to do something stupid if you know it hurts somebody else too. If, if you know that the money is not going to only come out of my trading account, but it's going to come out of our trading account. And, you know, perhaps it's the fact that you're going to have to justify that position to somebody, or, you know, perhaps it's just the fact that knowing that your actions have an impact on another human being's financial wealth or financial health, um, that that's a surprisingly powerful way to fix some of these behavioral problems. So, you know, you, you can, you, you can bring somebody else into it, uh, or you can just go back and listen to that basic structure that I outlined and put yourself through it and be your own coach, be your, you know, be, be, be your own source of discipline, but just make yourself at every stage, make yourself earn the right to go on. And by the way, this is a journey. This is months. This, this is not something we do in days. I don't even think it's something that can be done in weeks. This is something that is done over many, many months because within this structure, what this actually is, is a structure, a template to guide your growth as a trader. But it's still that. It's still you growing and developing as a trader. And that just takes time. <laughs> Awesome, man. I appreciate you really breaking that down step by step. I think that was that was really good and I'd encourage anyone who is struggling who can um, relate to the question I asked at the beginning to play that over and over a few times and, and actually write some notes down. I think um, that could be really helpful for you to follow that process. And I think we may have 
touched on psychology very briefly when we talked about it's a misconception that going to a completely systematic oh, approach yes. yeah, yeah. is um, going to get you around all psychology challenges, which it's obviously not. Just still in line with, uh, with this topic here about, you know, being a struggling trader, Another question came in, which which is in line with that. I'm good, just going to read out the, the full comment as I think it sort of paints the picture a little better, adds a bit of context. So uh, bear with me here. Breaking through to profitability is, in part, an exercise in discovering what you don't know. Discovering the unknown unknowns, if you will. Traders ultimately need the answers to questions they've yet to ask and professional traders can help shine light on those areas. After all, professional traders have crossed the chasm, I think I said that right, between confusion and profitability and the views from each side are very different. So, I'd suggest asking Adam the following. What are the top three questions or top few questions, if you will, top few questions aspiring traders should be asking but never do or often don't? That's a good question. And, you know, as a little personal aside, uh, I saw your post late at night. Uh, there was a huge storm here, so I was up late, couldn't sleep with the noise. And I, I saw the Facebook post, and I saw that somebody had actually asked a very specific list of questions. And when I read those questions, I thought, my gosh, you know, those are the wrong questions. And then this, this actually goes back to what I said in our previous conversation where, you know, you've really developed the skill of interviewing and asking the right questions because as soon as I got to the bottom of that, I saw you basically said the same thing. You said that these are not helpful questions you should be asking. And I thought at the time, you know, the question that guy really should be asking is what questions should I ask? And then this particular question that you just read came in, which is exactly that. Uh, you know, I, I think the in a situation, if if you just go to somebody and you say, well, what question should I be asking? That's you know, th- That kind of open-ended question can speak of laziness, but I don't think that is at all the case here. I think this is actually exactly the right way to structure and think about the question because you don't know, you, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, I think at the beginning, the questions that a trader should think about have to do with having a realistic understanding of expectations because a lot of people start trading thinking they're going to triple quadruple their money over some, you know, very small account over some year. Uh, how, what are realistic expectations? Uh, what's a typical learning curve? Uh, you know, what uh, the, the question of how, how should I learn to trade? Because I think there, there's a lot of misguided thought about this. You know, we have this idea that the harder we work, the better. So people come up with these crazy, rigorous ideas of sitting at a desk for hours and hours and hours, and that you have to put in your ten thousand hours, which is a that that that's a entirely separate discussion. Uh, there's no ten thousand hours. This is, that never was a thing. Um, so, so people have all of these misguided ideas. I think that one of the right questions is how can I best learn to trade? How can I best develop the skills of trading? And then there are things that you can only answer for yourself, you know, in terms of risk tolerance, how's this going to fit into your life? How long, if I tell you it's going to take you five years to learn to trade, are you up for that? Five years of pretty consistent losses. Um, you know, if, if, if you know that's the reality, then, you know, maybe you'll think about how to structure your trading so you uh, can lose as little as possible. But, you know, if if you believe that's going to happen, are you going to do this? Are, are, are you basically up for that? Those are the kinds of questions that I would ask as a beginning trader. And then kind of the next step is, um, what is your edge? What is your trading edge? How do you know that's an edge? And how do you know that edge is likely to be enduring? And that question is not so easily answered. But if you can't answer that, if I say, what's your edge? And you don't know how to answer that. You don't have any business risking money in the market until, you know, see somebody that's gone through that process I just outlined would have a good answer to that. This is my edge. And here's how, here's why I think, here's how I know that's my edge. Um, if you don't have an answer for that question, you don't have any business trading. I really liked that point you made about if this takes you five years to learn to to get to a point where you are profitable, if that 
that that amount of time does take five years. Are you going to do this still? I think that's a really good question to ask yourself. And I've said something along the same lines to people who have, you know, I get a lot of emails and that sort of thing from people listening to the podcast. And, you know, I think that's really something you do need to think about and answer. You know, if this is going to take you five years to become profitable, not saying that it, it definitely is, but if that was the case, would you still pursue this? I'll be more pessimistic than you, and I'll say it probably is going to take you five years. And and and, and whatever, what, whatever you know, fortunate things that happen to you inside of five years, whatever money you make is is not likely to be sticky. You know, I've seen lots of people who have thought they've learned to trade in a year and a half or two years, or people who get lucky in the first six months. And I. Yeah, I guess never say never, but I've I've never seen anybody who really develops enduring skill that early. Uh, Most of those people, you know, I think one of the worst things that can happen to a developing trader is you get lucky and make money at the beginning. That that's a hard thing to overcome. Uh, You know, I'd, I'd much rather see the market kick you around and punish you and see the the trader the trader who you know perhaps. seems backwards, but the trader who has had nothing but losses, you know, essentially nothing but losses and has struggled and just been so beaten up at the beginning. I think that trader has a better foundation for success than somebody who, you know, doubled their money buying options with their first trade. Yeah. And that's one of the things which has been really eye-opening from doing this podcast, having spoken with so many traders and hearing so many stories about how they took years and years to actually see any signs of success has been really interesting to hear about and sort of paints a realistic picture as well. That's one of the things that, you know, back to the, uh, you know, what insight the quantitative types, you know, if this was truly as purely quantitative of, of a game as we think it should be sometimes, I don't think that learning curve would be like that. You know, I, I think this would be a problem that people could solve in more of a step-by-step fashion and there'd be no reason for this long learning curve. But typically, even for quantitative traders with strong quantitative backgrounds, there is a massive learning curve when it comes to actually executing in the market. So perhaps that points us to, uh, you know, m- maybe we're still not asking exactly the right questions about how to learn to trade and what's actually behind the skill. Yeah. Yeah. Let's save the rest of that for another podcast. It sounds good. <laughs> Let's close this out. Adam, where is the best place listeners can go to find out more about you? Sure. Uh, so, follow me on Twitter at Adam H. Grimes. I Basically, everything I put out, I kind of put out there on Twitter. Uh, you can go to my website, adamhgrimes.com. That will take you to my blog. Uh, I also have a completely free, and there's no premium area, no upsell, but uh, I have a fairly massive trading course with 30-some hours of video that is, uh, you know, I've had uh, many traders, oh, it's, this has been out there a few years, but I've had many traders say that, you know, they th- this has been the thing that has taken them from um, uh, struggling to profitability. And you know, like I said, th- th- it, it's it's a great resource. I, I, I hope it's a great resource, but it's a resource that has helped people. Um, and it is absolutely completely free. You can find that, again, my blog, www.adamhgrimes.com. Uh, you also can check out my firm, waverlyadvisors.com. That is everything's linked from my blog, but I do write a daily research piece that depending on how you trade and what kind of trader you are, that might be something that, uh, you know, could be, could be very useful for you. Uh, I cover all the assets that I trade. So I cover, uh, you know, currencies, commodities, stocks, we cover volatility, timeframes from intraday to longer term. Our focus is on, you know, probably what I'd say intermediate term, a few days to a few weeks. So, you know, check that out there. There's a, you know, free trial. Love to have you take a look at it. Cool. Yeah. And I have also heard nothing but great things about uh, your free course as well. It often comes up in discussion in the Facebook group, people talking about how it, you know, they have got a lot of value from it. So, uh, I'll make sure to include links to all of this in the show notes. Also, your podcast, are you starting that back up? I know last time you were on, you were doing it fairly frequently. It sort of um, faded out a little bit. Is that coming back? It, it is. You know, I, in, you and I talked about this a couple of days ago. Uh, I really respect what you've done here with building, uh, 
momentum and a brand and, and you know, you've, you, you've certainly built a very successful podcast. I was basically less than thrilled with mine, though I was getting a, lo- a lot of very positive feedback. Uh, and I took some time off that turned into some more time off to kind of figure out how to recalibrate and retune that. Uh, and uh, I'm looking actually th- th- very likely I'll have a new episode out by the time you publish this. So the short answer is yes. Ah, cool, cool. And that's the podcast is called Market Life, correct? Market Life, yes. And that also is linked from my blog. So if you go to adamhgrimes.com, I've kind of created that as a, uh, you know, it's kind of a hub for everything. So you'll find the podcast there too. It's also on iTunes and, you know, every place else. Sure. And uh, right at the beginning, you mentioned that you have a new book on the way as well. How's that coming along? Do you have any idea for when we can maybe expect that? Uh, keep keep in touch with my blog and Twitter, and I'll let you know as it comes along. Uh, it's, you know, for me, the process of writing a book, when, when it's when everything is right, and, and this is an entirely separate discussion, it, it's rather it's rather easy. Yeah, but it I just don't quite have all the pieces fitting together yet. So uh, I'm struggling a little bit with the craftsmanship, worksmanship aspect of it. Um, but you know, again, uh, working hard on it, and hopefully I'll turn the corner. What once I once I start to make good progress on it, it should come together pretty quickly. Okay, so it's still a work in progress. We'll we'll keep an eye out for it. Um, Adam, one last question. I, I think that there's going to be some listeners who have listened through this podcast, and they're probably going to have some questions regarding some of the topics uh, which we've gone into and discussed. Would you be open to answering uh, some questions in the comments area of this interview on the website? Absolutely. Uh, you know, and I may steal some of the questions for blog posts because I, you know, I think the good stuff on my blog were, has been provoked. Let's, I guess I should say inspired, right? Inspired is a better word than provoked, but this has been provoked by uh, smart questions from traders who, uh, you know, either have a different perspective or, you know, know more than I do. So, uh, yes, I'll, I certainly I'll address comments and, you know, I may, I may build some of them out into bigger picture answers. So, please, I, I, I value the interaction and questions from listeners and readers very much. So, please ask away. Uh, excellent. I appreciate you offering to do that. So, guys listening, if you do have a question for Adam, go to chatwithtraders.com slash 115. This is episode 115. Scroll to the bottom of the page. You'll see the comments area. Write your questions in the comments. I'll keep a close eye on it and let Adam know of any questions that come through so that he can um, do his best to answer questions and share insight where he can. So, Adam, again, thank you very much for coming on the podcast, man, um, and giving what's almost two hours of your time um, to, to share your insight with listeners. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.